Hello and welcome to the Ask Assad Show. I'm Michael Gaines, host of the podcast NOV Today, and glad you are joining us today on this episode of Ask Assad, where we try to bring insight out and share a perspective from NOV on uh, the energy market and uh, how we see the world and, and also get uh, some additional insight and perspective from uh, our team. So, uh, of course, joining me as always is the show's namesake, Asad Mahana, who is NOV's Director of Business Strategy, and we'll be talking to him in uh, just a moment. And uh, of course, we uh, today is a, a special day that we have a special guest that we'll let Asad uh, introduce in just one moment. Uh, but before we do, we're going to go over to Shelby Demain, who's uh, NOV's uh, Digital Content Specialist, to uh, give us a little insight on uh, today's show and uh, and kind of how how this might be a little bit different than than what folks are normally used to. Absolutely, Michael. So yeah, normally uh, on the Ask Assad show, the way we ask questions is through the mailbag segment, and uh, we pull questions that we've gotten from our comment line, from our phone number, and from our email, as well as social media in the last week. And that's kind of what we ask Assad in that section. But today, because we do have such a special guest joining us, we wanted to make sure we took a, take advantage of having him live on air. So we are actually going to be taking some live comments and questions throughout the show. So if you have any questions uh, for Asad or for our guest, Artem, you can comment those throughout. And uh, we're going to have some live Q&A at the end. And we might also ask some of uh, the mailbag questions that we have gotten the last week. Uh, so I look forward to kind of seeing your questions. I will be uh, in Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube comment sections, the whole show, looking at those uh, questions. Okay, great. And I know that uh, we've tried to make it easy for folks to get us comments Ooh. and questions, not only for the show, but for uh, future shows in mm -hmm. general. And uh, and before we dive into our, our main combo today, I just wanted to make sure that we shared that, that information with those that might not be familiar. Absolutely. So we have a couple ways you can reach us if you do have a question that you want to submit to our mailbag. The first way is by commenting on uh, these live shows. So if you have a question and you want to ask, you know, make sure it gets asked. You can just say this is for the mailbag. Here's my question. Um, and then a few of the of the other ways is we have an email. So you can email askasad at nov.com. It's on the screen now. And finally, and maybe my favorite way is we have a, a phone number for a comment line. So that number is 346-223-4799. Uh, what I like about this feature is if you wanna call and be completely anonymous, you can do so. Or if you wanna uh, let us know your name, then we can kind of feature you on that on the next show when we do the mailbag questions. So uh, kind of pick your, pick your avenue and, and we'd love to get your questions that way. Great, all right, well, thanks Shelby. And uh, yeah, thanks. so thanks for joining us here. It looks like we've got folks from, from all over uh, joining us. I see, see you in the comments, so thanks for uh, participating. Uh, so uh, we're gonna kind of jump in and, and get in, uh, in a conversation here with Asad Mahana, uh, our Director of Business Strategy. Uh, Asad, good to see you this week. Good to see you too, Michael. All right. So, all right, so uh, Asad wanted to uh maybe just kind of dive in a little bit and uh talk about uh you know some of the things that are on your mind i know that uh of course we've been uh looking at uh, really a, a topic today which is research and methodology and kind of how how we look at that space and and obviously that's that's your uh, your nine to five so so could you give us a little little background and insight um you know for those that might not no, say okay. Well, you know, director of business strategy. You know, part of it is is really you know research analysis. What does it look like? How do how do we how do we approach that world? Yeah. So uh, we we mentioned uh, Michael the the other time a little bit on what the kind of the role is. And it's kind of the internal uh, consultancy for the organization and working with the businesses, working with the organization on identifying uh, market trends, identifying opportunities, identifying spaces where. Uh, we could act on and we need some more um, uh, kind of visibility. Uh, our, our, uh, our process kind of, uh, regardless of what the topic is or the ask, uh, kind of kind of repeats uh, from one project or one area to the next. Uh, and really to build insight and, and really defining insight is, is stuff that you can't find online or you can't find just by uh, opening up a book or, or uh, uh, you know, a, a report uh, and, and can find really insight that 
uh, reflects to uh, what, what it means to us as an organization and as a business. So our four steps involved in building that insights that eventually lead to a strategy. And those, those four steps, uh, we almost always will start with market research. So looking at what is it that's happened out there? What have others done to uh, identify what kind of trends have been building up over history? What kind of projections do they see going forward? Who are the different players uh, contributing to a certain space? Um, uh, and, and what are kind of the relationship between these players? Who's owning the market and, and, and uh, who, or, or who's leading the market? Um, and then in terms of a second step, once we have that visit, broad visibility, something that's probably accessible to many, uh, we, we go a step further and say, what's the, the, the analysis? What's the industry analysis of that? And what I mean by that is uh, looking at the market forces. You know, we use five porters as a, as a means to, uh, to kind of dissect and identify what are the dynamics of a particular industry or a particular uh, business we're looking into. What are the different business models um, with which those different players interact and who's at a most disadvantage and who's at the very end of the value chain. Um, and also within that industry analysis, we'll look at some of the historical background for that business. What, uh, you know, what has been tried? What have companies, uh, 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 or what, what do today's companies and today's business models um, uh, reflect in terms of historical consolidations or integrations or uh, efforts that have been taken to support that customer base. The third step to build insight is the interviews. Uh, and really, that's a very critical, uh, as each of them is, uh, but also a critical step to building insight. And that's really working internally within the organization. We have businesses that cover a, very, a wide bandwidth uh, of the upstream oil and gas and, uh, um, and help us kind of understand from those that are in the field, from those that are interacting with the customers, um, who's doing what, um, uh, what, are, what are customers uh, really complaining about and and uh, where where do we find ourselves as bringing value um, that that interviews aspect is also done externally where whether it's in person um, communication with uh, the customer base uh, that we get through the businesses through our relationships uh, but also through surveys where we reach out and say okay what what's how satisfied are you with this particular capability of that product out there and how important is that? Um, it performs better, for instance. And on top of that, one thing to understand that's not always uh, uh, clear is the willingness to pay. And when you you know when you put satisfaction, importance, and willingness to pay together, that really gives you a basis for how much investment you want to go into a particular product. So once we have those three together, we go into the building insight aspect, and we go and say, uh, what does this mean to our industry? Really translate all of that that we've uh, accumulated all that knowledge, all that uh, information that's put together, put it in a story that means something to our business. And from there, uh, reflect into a strategy formulation, which ends up being implemented or not. Right. So I know that a lot, uh, some of the, the focus, uh, you know, when you're talking about, you know, coming up with, with research and, and uh, some of the analysis, I know that, that you've spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, really using the, the four steps that, that you've outlined and applying that out in the uh, in the, the areas that are predominantly uh, shale focused and uh, are kind of have a, a, a focus in, in that area. So, what is what does that look like? Yeah, uh, Michael, you know, I've uh, I've spent eight years before moving to Houston in the Middle East, um, and my mind was for the most part uh, uh, programmed for kind of the applications in places like Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, Qatar. Um, uh, it, when I moved to, to, to the U.S. and kind of gotten more of a international perspective, uh, clearly shale was the, the most uh, eye-catching to me. Um, and, and that's a question we keep getting in terms of what, where's, where's shale going or what's the, how's shale disrupted this whole industry? Um, uh, if you remember, shale hasn't existed for very long. It's been around for only 15 years, and it's already consuming hundreds of billions of dollars every year in terms of capex, which for this year we've seen slashed quite a bit. Uh, but um, it, it's, it's been North America focused only too. So that, that leaves a lot of room for expansion. 
uh, worldwide. And we've, we've seen places like Argentina, Vaca Muerta, or, or Russia, and perhaps some places in the Middle East too, uh, where that could expand into. So yes, uh, for a very good reason, people are wondering uh, why shale and where shale heading and how does it compare with other sources of hydrocarbons? Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really one of the things that caused quite a bit of uh, volatility when it comes to our conventional resources. Um, um, we've, we've experienced some, uh, you know, that downturn in 2014 was uh, j just like the downturn in uh, 2019 or 2020 um, is, is to a great extent uh, caused by an oversupply. Um, and which is why it's uh, it's been such a such an area of interest. Now to to address that, and I you know this this episode today, I wanted to to kind of make sure we we uh, we give it its its fair share. Um, and uh, I'd like to to introduce our, our special guest for this episode, Artem Abramov uh, from Rystad Energy. Uh, and I'll say uh, that uh, that Rystad has been a good partner of NOV for the last year and a half or so in supporting us in uh, not only the market research, but some of the analysis as well for how we get to our insights. So uh, uh, Artem, welcome uh, from, from Oslo. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's great to have you with us today. I wanna, uh, I, I wanna say that uh, like, like other partners out there, we've, we've had the the opportunity to uh, to work with you guys and and, and get uh, some 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 great support in in how we look at some of the businesses and get insight on uh, and what you've uh, what you've guys uh, 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 worked on. Uh, I'll I'll do a quick introduction for for Artem. I know your your partner and VP of analysis at Rystad Energy's uh, Shell Data Research Team. You're responsible for the empirical analysis of North America shale activity. Um, and your product manager for the Rystad Energy Shale Well Database and a key contributor to shale reports and commentaries. Yes, sounds right. And yeah, thank you for this introduction. <laughs> yeah, so so welcome, welcome in. Um, uh, uh, I know you have some some stuff to share with us today, uh, Artem. Uh, I'll uh, I'll pass the, the floor to you. Can I give us a little bit of a an insight uh, from Rystat perspective on uh, where you guys feel the, the shale industry is heading. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Assad. And um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I, what I wanted to do today, I wanted to share with you uh, some of our latest thoughts uh, and perspectives on the US um, uh, shale oil and gas industry. Um, uh, as was already mentioned, um, the US shale uh, was really a major driver of global market disruption uh, in the last two to, two to three years. Uh, we just got so much oil, actually incremental oil production coming out of the US and uh, both in 2015, uh, 2014, sorry, and also last year, uh, some of this growth uh, was really outperforming market consensus and projections. So to a large extent, uh, US shale industry itself contributed uh, to uh, the collapse in the global oil prices already twice. Um, so what I really wanted to do, I wanted to highlight some of the high level uh, latest trends around the activity in the US shale and also what is happening with the production. Uh, uh, so we can all understand a little bit better what we should expect from this uh, source of supply in the next few months or quarters. Uh, so if we go to the next uh, slide in the presentation, there is one very important activity metric, uh, uh, which is uh, typically viewed as a barometer, uh, uh, you know, the activity level in the whole industry in the US. It is the rig counts, the number of rigs uh, which are drilling the vast at any given point of time. Uh, and uh, this time, in the, just in the last three months, uh, since the start of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we were seeing unprecedented collapse in the activity level. Uh, if you look at oil focused rigs, uh, they already declined by 73% from the peak activity level, which we had in the middle of uh, March 2020. Uh, so it is much faster decline uh, compared to what we saw in all previous downturns and the cumulative 
um, magnitude of decline already exceeded what was achieved in the previous downturns. Uh, I should also mention what is happening on the gas side, uh, gas focused drilling in the country, uh, it just keeps declining, it's a linear decline trend, uh, which kind of started in the middle of 2019 due to very low uh, gas price environments. Uh, and if we go to the next page, uh, there is another very important activity metric in the US shale. It is the fracking activity, uh, because when the, the well is drilled, uh, then uh, frac spread has to arrive to the site and uh, uh, execute basically hydraulic fracturing operations before the well, before the well can start producing. And it's arguably even more important metric if you want to say something educated about short term production potential in the country because it's really the valves which were fracked, they drive the production additions in the next two to three months. Uh, and fracking activity in the country, it collapsed uh, even faster than the drilling. So between February and May, uh, we saw 80% decline uh, in fracking. A lot of um, oil focused producers, uh, they in, uh, initiated something that they call frack holidays. So they stopped or froze more or less all frack operations uh, which they were running. Uh, of course, uh, service companies, uh, they don't like uh, these term frack holidays very much because there is nothing, you know, uh, similar to a normal holiday for service companies because this is really the source of revenues for them. Uh, on a positive side uh, for the US industry in general, uh, we started seeing some signs of the recovery in the industry. There are many different indications that activity uh, hit the bottom. And in June, uh, some operators, they started adding uh, frack spreads in different fields. But this is really a marginal increase. Uh, we'll see a little bit of increased activity in July and August, but activity is not going back uh, to the levels where it was in 2019, not this year at least. Uh, and if we go to the next page, um, um, uh, there is also one uh, additional very important activity metric, which many people in the markets really track. Uh, it is the inventory of drilled wells which are awaiting frac services, so uh, DUC inventory, drilled and completed wells. Uh, if you look at all oil basins in the US combined, that the number of such wells increased from 5,000 wells to 5,700 wells in the last three months. And of course, we can debate whether the 700 well increase is significant or not, but there is one very simple way to uh, illustrate the anomaly in the standard operational patterns. We can just look at the ratio of DC inventory to the running rate of the frac activity, the number of wells we frac every month. Because historically, this ratio fluctuated in a very narrow range of four to six months. We were seeing some seasonal buildup during winter months and then gradual depletion during spring and summer. Now, uh, there, uh, there, this ratio moved away from this normal range to unprecedented level. And you see inventory is actually equivalent to two years of fracking at the current pace. So the key takeaway from this is that whenever oil prices improve substantially, we'll already have enough potential in the existing GC inventory to deliver on incremental fracking relatively quickly. But then it will all be about two factors. One is availability of the capital, because we don't expect a ton of new capital to be injected into the industry next year, regardless of the oil price environment. It's a new business model, uh, very much disciplined capital programs. Uh, and second thing, which is also very important, is the capacity which will be left on the service industry side. Because any prolonged downturn always results in significant degradation in the pressure pumping capacity. A lot of equipment is being cannibalized, not maintained properly. Uh, there is a labor shortage, uh, which always happens. So ultimately, uh, when it's a time for the next up cycle, uh, it takes several quarters for the service industry to really deliver on incremental demand. Uh, and if you go to the next page, there is one more very important topic uh, uh, which people were really focused on in the last few months is uh, production curtailments. So we are not talking about the decline in the activity and the volumes uh, which uh, basically uh, you know didn't come online due to the collapse in fracking, but we are talking about already producing bus. Uh, and many of these wells, they uh, actually struggled to cover their cash costs in April and May and producers had no option but actually to uh, shut them in. Uh, so we saw a wide range of different strategies. Uh, we saw some complete shut-ins or the least economic wells. 
typically they're called marginal or strip valves. Uh, we also saw some partial shut-ins, restricted flows on more modern valves, and we also saw some valves which were fracked, but the process of putting them on production was actually delayed, and this was also classified as curtailments by operators or gas companies. So in total, uh, for the whole US, we were tracking around 1.6 million barrels a day of production curtailments in May. Now, uh, we don't have any empiric evidence or data for June yet, uh, but we are talking to our ENP and also midstream clients, and they all report increased flows in different pipeline systems. So some volumes are coming back already now, and by the end of summer, if oil prices remain where they are today, we anticipate that 80% of the uh, volumes will actually come back online. Uh, and if we go to the next page, all these uh, kind of brings me to our base case view on the U.S. oil production and how it might develop in the next few months. So if you just look at the bold orange line, which is the latest base case which we have, it is very likely that the U.S. oil production will actually hit the bottom uh, in June. Uh, and in July and August, reactivation of curtailments will be sufficient to offset natural decline caused by very low fracking activity. But as we move towards the end of the year, uh, we shouldn't expect a sustainable recovery for the industry because this actually requires quite significant increase in the fracking activity. So it is very likely that the US oil production will just uh, you know, stabilize at the level of around 10.7, 10.8 million barrels a day. And it won't be before 2021 when we can anticipate uh, another phase of production growth. Uh, and if we go to the next page, uh, uh, what is quite interesting about the U.S. shale, and uh, sometimes people just forget about this, and it's really a unique feature of the U.S. shale reservoirs, is that the base decline, the pace at which production falls if we don't complete any new bus, it changes very quickly if activity level changes as well. It happened in 2015 and 16. It is happening now even faster. So essentially, when activity level collapses, in the first months, your production declines very quickly. But two, three quarters down the road, base production becomes much more mature. And the number of valves which you have to complete every month just to keep production flat is becomes substantially lower than the number of valves we had to complete several uh, couple of quarters ago. So if you just look at the orange line, uh, something that we call a balance in well count or the maintenance activity requirements, the number of valves which we need to complete to keep production flat. Uh, then in the beginning of 2020, we had to complete around 700 wells in oil basins to keep production flat. The actual activity, the green line, now it's substantially below these maintenance requirements. But by the end of 2020, the balance in well counts will uh, decline towards 400 wells per month. So as soon as activity rebounds and increases uh, to, to the level which is higher than these 400 wells, we'll start seeing positive production trajectory in the U.S. again. So, Artem, I mean, I think this is really good and, and kind of talking to the point you made uh, a moment ago on the on the previous image. So it, it, is it is it a fair summary to say that it, it, based on your your analysis, you're looking at more of a, a, a lower for longer type of, of approach in terms of of uh, uh, the, the overall outlook and oil production? So uh, we, we just need to remember that the U.S. oil industry is very kind of uh, market driven. So the price uh, is a very important input and uh, the sensitivity of production and activity uh, to the price environment is, is, is quite extreme. So it's very different, uh, you know, compared to what we see in Saudi or uh, Russia, for example. Uh, and uh, in our base case, we anticipate a gradual price recovery next year towards $50 per barrel WTI by the end of 2021. If this happens, then the activity will increase organically. So th there won't be a lot of uh, capital injection uh, from investors into the industry next year, but a lot of companies, they will be able to gradually increase uh, the capex and completions uh, in organic manner, in self-finance manner. And uh, the key point which I'm trying to make is that in these price environments, $45 WTI on average, uh, even though activity will remain substantially below compared to what we saw in 2018 and 19. This activity level will be sufficient to start seeing, uh, you know, positive production tendency. But we're not talking about, uh, you know, the, the magnitude of growth 
uh, 2 million barrels a day, which we saw in 2018. These actually requires much higher prices now. Is there an aspect of uh, COVID-19 reaction? Uh, yes, so, uh, I guess, uh, you know, it all started from the collapse uh, of the previous OPEC Plus agreement uh, in early March. Uh, but I think we, we quickly forgot about this collapse uh, with all the, you know, uh, additional impact um, uh, on the demand yeah. side of the equation because COVID-19 pandemic resulted in unprecedented uh, global liquid demand destruction, almost 30 million barrels a day in April. Now the lockdowns uh, have been uh, kind of, uh, you know, the restrictions have been lifted. Yeah. Uh, the demand is gradually recovering, but there are still some concerns uh, about uh, the second wave of COVID-19 spread. So we shouldn't anticipate that global consumption of all products will go back all the way to pre-COVID-19 levels uh, this year. And some segments like, for example, jet fuel consumption, uh, they will also see some structural or behavioral changes. So airline industry, it would take probably several years for them to recover to pre-COVID-19 levels. Uh -huh. So for those that just joined us, we're talking uh, with Artem uh, Abramov, who is the head of shale research for Rystad Energy. Uh, here on the Ask Assad show. And uh, we're talking about our, our theme today is, is really around research and insights. Uh, of course, we talked a little bit earlier with Assad Mahana, NOV's director of business strategy on how NOV tackles that. And uh, of course, we're talking about um, uh, some perspectives in the shale space with our guest, uh, Artem. So uh, Artem, uh, I, I know that we'll be taking some questions from those that are are viewing, but uh, I know we've got a, a few minutes left, so I wanted to go ahead and and let you you continue on because I think that this is really uh, uh, ins insightful and, and interesting uh, perspectives as we look ahead to uh, not only the rest of this year, but but kind of what the the future holds. Yes, thank you. So um, uh, you know, there was one additional thing which I really wanted to highlight. Uh, we do a lot of uh, service of our um, uh, clients, um, uh, you know, and uh, uh, industry network. Uh, and uh, there is a very interesting thing uh, is that more and more people believe uh, that the next phase of the U.S. shale uh, recovery or growth will be very different compared to what we saw in the last three years. So actually 60% of uh, our industry contacts, they think that the growth will be primarily driven by a handful of large, well-established producers, companies like Super Majors, uh, Exxon, Chevron, and also leading shale operators, uh, Pioneer, EOG, or country resources, uh, which have very strong balance sheets, so they don't require too much uh, capital injection. And simultaneously, they have um, uh, access to the core Accurate to the most prospective drill location, so they achieved a certain level of operational excellence. So we will not necessarily have all these uh, private equity firms, smaller operators, coming back as quickly uh, as what we saw in 2017 and 19. Uh, and then, if we go to the next uh, slide, um, uh, I also wanted to highlight, uh, you know, uh, uh, some uh, per perspectives on the gas side of the equation because uh, total gas production in the US is now declining. There is a fundamental decline trend. Uh, by the end of the year, production will decline by around 10 billion cubic feet per day on year over year basis. Most of these declines, uh, they come from associated gas, basically from oil basins, uh, not really from gas uh, basins like Appalachian or Hainesville in Louisiana. Uh, and uh, if you put this production in the context of uh, consumption, even if we forget about LNG exports from the US, then next year the market looks very undersupplied. Uh, essentially, we cannot even satisfy the domestic consumption. Uh, we include some additional coal to gas switching in power generation segments in our models, but even without this switching, we'll be like 1 to 1.5 BCF a day short of the consumption level. So. What this really means is that uh, we need, uh, uh, you know, one of the following to happen. Either we need a pretty strong recovery of the activity in the gas basins, but it cannot be justified by the current gas prices, even though gas prices are in strong contango, or we need to have a swift recovery from associated gas. Uh, and right now we are really leaning towards the second scenario. Uh, so we don't see any up cycle for the gas 
uh, activity in the U.S. in short term, uh, as long as oil prices remain uh, close to $40 per barrel, next year we'll start seeing quite rapid increase in associated gas production in the Permian Basin and also some other oil regions. Uh, and finally, on the last slide, um, uh, there is also very important market, uh, natural gas liquids. Uh, typically, they're viewed as sub-products, um, uh, uh, but most of the NGL production in the US really comes from oil basins, where gas is very liquid-rich. Uh, NGL production in the US is also declining right now, uh, 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 and it's very sensitive to the ethane recovery. Uh, because uh, when uh, prices for ethane, which is a part of NGOs, declines, uh, a lot of ethane uh, uh, can be basically switched on and off very quickly. Uh, so we always think in uh, terms of range of outcomes, even when we freeze oil and gas prices at a certain level. Uh, so now uh, there is quite significant improvement in uh, NGO prices uh, for ethane, propane and butane, not so much for C5 plus natural gasoline components. Uh, and these improvements, in our view, will uh, persist uh, as we move towards the end of the year and global consumption recovers. And then suddenly we realize that uh, we are short on the supply of LPG, propane and butane, and also ethane in the country. So all these things, they will actually trigger upcycle in NGL markets. And a lot of producers which have access to liquid rich acreage positions in gas and oil basins, they will actually be leveraged uh, on this additional uh, you know, NGL recovery. So that, that will be quite substantial uh, transition of the activity from dry gas to liquids rich gas areas. Wow. Yeah, no, that's that's really insightful and, and really appreciate the, the perspective there. Um, quite quite the outlook. Uh, and yeah, we're certainly hoping for, you know, continued positive momentum as we, we uh, finish out this year and get into the, the next year. I, I know that there are some that uh, have been watching us today and and had uh, had a question for you. I know we're we're a little bit shorter on time today, so uh, we'll we'll be able to get one of those questions in. And and to do that, we'll bring in Shelby Dumain uh, to to help us out. Hey, Shelby. Hey, Michael. Uh, so this question comes from Andy actually on YouTube, and he was wondering if y'all could talk a little. And I think this could be for Assad or Artem. Can you talk on how you gather this info and and what how you track and forecast all of this information? Hmm. Yes, uh, absolutely. So we uh, we work a lot with public data, uh, the data coming from different energy regulators. Uh, for example, in the US, there is a state agency uh, in every state which collects and publishes all wild level information. Uh, so what we do, we clean all this information, we standardize the data structure, convert it to some sort of common format, uh, and then we do a lot of uh, analytics uh, on the raw uh, clean data. Uh, in addition to that, we use a lot of alternative data sources. Uh, so we have some partnerships with um, uh, various industry um, uh, uh, contacts. Uh, we also use satellite data a lot in our analysis. For example, when we monitor fracking activity, uh, we cannot rely on the public data too much because there is a very large reporting delay uh, in the most recent five, six months. So you don't get complete picture from public data sources. So we use high frequency satellite data, monitor around 50,000 of permitted and already drilled locations continuously in the whole country. And then we interpret these images to understand where frac operations are happening right now. So there are many different data sources, basically, which will ultimately go uh, into our uh, products and research. Right. Uh, Artem, how, how, do you, uh, how do you see the uh, cost per barrel being impacted with all of this? Uh, crisis. So the, 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 in the U.S. shale specifically, uh, the break-even prices or uh, cost per barrel, uh, they, they are improving. Uh, some of these things are cyclical. Uh, for example, service prices are really collapsed uh, by 20 to 30 percent, depending on the segment. And yeah. oil and gas companies, they're able to leverage on this uh, cost deflation. And uh, uh, in the previous downturn, we actually learned that some service cost deflation is actually structural. So prices never returned to the level where they were in 2014. So service companies, they were still operating with very, pretty thin margins, even in 2017 and 18. So something similar might happen now. Uh, so of course, it's not an extremely positive outlook for some service companies, uh, but uh, some structural changes will uh, happen in the service industry, which will help 
the best, most efficient uh, players to basically survive and adapt to the new price reality. And then there are some structural improvements, the learning curve, optimization of well and project design, automation, uh, focus on the uh, sweet spots and high grading. Uh, so all these things that are still happening, uh, which ultimately push uh, break-even prices and cost per borrow in the share down. So it becomes more and more competitive uh, in the global context. Great. Wow. Well, thanks, uh, Artem, for uh, joining us on the Ask Asad show today and, and sharing uh, that insight. I know that uh, I, I learned quite a bit. Um, I know that I assume and, and expect that Asad did as well. I think we're, we're both uh, definitely in the camp of lifelong learners. So uh, definitely learning, learning a lot there. So uh, thanks for, for joining us. And uh, so we've been speaking with Artem. Uh, Abramov, who is the head of shale research uh, at Rystad Energy. So, uh, Artem, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So, Asad, I know that now we're going to transition into, uh, I think we'll, we'll have a little bit of time to get, to get one of our mailbag questions uh, in that, that we had. And, of course, that we got that from uh, either someone that called in or someone that sent an email to, to ask Asad at at NLV.com. So we're gonna bring Shelly back in to see if we can get that uh, mailbag question over to you. Absolutely, so this question came uh, from last week, like, like Michael mentioned, from our mailbag from Shankar, and, and he was asking, he said, rig count in EMEA region, which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa, uh, did not reduce much at all, but in our country, it has gone down almost 50%. So can you talk about maybe some of the reasons that could have caused this? Yeah, great, uh, great question and, and on point uh, with what we just discussed. Uh, like I said, I've, I've spent a little bit of time in the Middle East, so I can I can talk uh, a bit uh, to to kind of the difference in activity. I mean, uh, shell shell activity is really uh, uh, not the benchmark. It's 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 conventional drilling activity that uh, we've all been used to. It's exceptional how shale. Um, how, how quick is shale is to 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 develop and to grow uh, and 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 to deplete at the same time? So that that unique, uh, really really bad geology um, uh, that's that's rich in hydrocarbons yet uh, has the tendency to deplete very rapidly, kind of creates its new rules of of drilling activity. Now, why rig count would be so volatile? In, 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 sh in the shale world compared to what happens in the Middle East is just because of uh, how, uh, how, how long it takes to develop those fields. And I'll give you an example. Um, in the US in 2014, we drilled north of 24,000 wells uh, to uh, produce maybe five or six million barrels a day from shale. Uh, if you look at, at Saudi Arabia, there were less than a thousand wells drilled, maybe, maybe actually 500 new wells drilled, another 500 work over. Um, and that was to produce 10,000 barrels of, uh, or to support 10,000 barrels of oil per day. Um, it takes many months of preparation and many months of drilling and another several months of completion and production to get a well online in the Middle East. Uh, while it takes four months from spud to production in the share world to uh, to get that well drilled in as little as uh, sometimes less than a week, but on average maybe 18 days, 20 days um, um, if, in, 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 in shale. Um, and the last point is how much production are you getting per well? We're, we've seen you know early on in the shale revolution, um, a shale well producing about 400, maybe 500 barrels of oil on peak oil or, you know, day one or the first 30 days of that well wasn't more than a few hundred barrels. Today, we're close to a thousand. Some wells produce 1,100 barrels a day over the first few days. Uh, but, but that's how high it gets. A well, a, a conventional oil well in Saudi Arabia could give you five, maybe 10,000 barrels of oil a day on its peak oil. And its depletion rate, as opposed to a shale well being close to 50 or 60 percent depletion per year, um, in the Middle East, it's closer to single digit depletion rates. Uh, so uh, vast, vast difference in terms of 
uh, cycle of production of a conventional field in the Middle East versus a unconventional uh, uh, field in, in the shale world. And I'll, and I'll conclude that this is an extremely interesting topic that uh, we're always interested in, just the dynamics of operators and NOCs or national oil companies in the Middle East versus um, behavior in, in independents and majors in the US and Canada. Um, and how that uh, results in opportunities for better technology, reducing cost of uh, production, cost per barrel. Absolutely, and and I think Assad, to your point about you know these questions being so great and so interesting, is uh, this is kind of an example of one that we saw and said that might be a whole show, you know, that we talk yeah. about just that. So uh, maybe that would be that this might be a future topic we we could talk yeah. on. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and people, everyone watching, um, if you have any other questions that you want to submit for future shows or even ideas uh, for the main topic of the show, you can submit those. We have a, a, a couple of different ways. If, the, if you just want to comment down below, we go through and we make sure to capture and record um, all of the questions that get asked that we don't have time to get to uh, during the show live. And uh, we go ahead and put those in our mailbag. We also have our email. You can email askassad at nov.com. Uh, we take questions there as well. And finally, like I've mentioned before, my favorite is the uh, comment line. So you can call 346-223-4799 and leave us a voicemail. Uh, like I said, you can be anonymous. You can say your name, whatever uh, you prefer, and we'll be sure to have those questions in future shows. All right. Well, that sounds good. Well, thanks, Shelby and Assad, for uh, joining us today. Uh, certainly a special thanks to our guest, uh, Artem uh, Abramov from uh, Rystad Energy. And certainly want to thank you for joining us and uh, being here in the conversation that we had today. We always look forward to uh, getting your questions and, and uh, providing that insight to you from our team. So from all of us here at NOV, Thanks for listening and thanks for watching and we'll talk to you later.